Hey, good morning, Foundry Church. My name is Jeff Vandermolen, and I'm the online venue pastor and ministry director here at the Foundry Church. And it is a great day to come together to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. I'm currently here in our worship space here at the Foundry Church, and I'm excited to join you in worship this morning. Um, just a few updates for you. If you'd like to stay connected to what's going on here at the Foundry Church, um, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number one key. Now, a few other announcements. We at the Foundry believe that we are called to be transformed into the image of God. In order for that transformation to happen, we need to be spending time with our Lord and Savior. And one way we can do that is by spending time in the Word of God. So that's why we created these. These are our devotionals um, that contain the whole book of Proverbs and will really just encourage you in your walk with the Lord. And for the current series that we're in right now, we put together these pamphlets um, that are called Intersection. And they contain scripture passages that will better prepare you for what the pastor will be talking about on Sunday morning. So if you have not picked up any of these, it's not too late. Um, you can do so anytime going to the West Stores in the airlock. You'll find a hard copy of both of these. Uh, if you live outside of West Michigan and you would like me to ship you a hard copy, just send me an email online at foundrychurch.net and I'll make sure that they get shipped out to you. Or if you prefer to access them electronically, you can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, scroll down, and you'll find them there. Um, I also just want to say thank you um, for your generosity and the giving of your offerings and God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry, there's a couple different ways you can do so. Um, you can mail us your offering. Uh, the address of our church is up on the screen right now, or if you'd prefer to do it electronically, you can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, um, and go to the Give tab and follow the instructions there. Um, and I'm also so excited to share with you um, our first event for the young adult ministry here at the Foundry Church. It's going to be happening tonight at Holland State Park. So if you consider yourself a young adult, um, show up at 6 o'clock. They're going to be along the channel. There's going to be free food. There's going to be games. And it'll be a time for you just to connect with our young adult leaders, volunteers, and also other young adults. So we encourage you, if you don't have anything going on tonight, head out to Holland State Park, 6 o'clock for free food and free games. And I am so, so excited to introduce to you the newest members of the Foundry Church. And they are Denver Lee Vanderkamp, born to Jessica and Dylan Vanderkamp. And we have Cade Robert Westra, born to Brittany and Corey Westra. Gavin Philip Lotz, born to Emily and Jeremy Lotz. Olivia Grace Keekover, born to John and Amanda Keekover. Raina Dawn Akterhoff, born to Brad and Kaylin Akterhoff. So we are so thankful um, for these newest members of our Foundry community. I just want to encourage you to be in prayer for them, for their families as they transition into this life with the newest members of their family. And, and also just for um, them to be surrounded by individuals who encourage them in their walk and in their faith journey. All right, that's all the announcements I have this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we're just so thankful that we get to come and we get to worship you in this place. Um, God, no matter where we're worshiping, we know you are there with us. And Father, I just pray this morning, as Pastor Matt speaks, I pray that we have open hearts to, to receive what it is that you have for us. Lord, that we would have open hearts to receive what it is and then act out of courageous obedience to what you're calling us into next. Um, Lord, we know that following you is not always a life of comfort, but you call us you call us out of those comfort, comfortable situations. And Lord, you call us to grow and to be transformed into your image. So Lord, we just pray for your strength to step out into those, those difficult situations. And Lord, I also pray this morning for Pastor Matt as he gives the message. May the words that he speaks, may they be um, words that come from you. And just, um, yeah, Lord, we just thank you and welcome you into this place. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
show up while you're dreaming. Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you. Nobody, nobody will believe you. Every day you try to pick up all the pieces. All the memories they still will never leave you. Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you. Nobody, nobody will believe you. God only knows what you've been through. God only knows what they say about you. God only knows how it's killing you. You say what kind of love that God only knows. God only knows what you've been through. God only knows what they say about you. God only knows how it's killing you. When you need a ride, call Eric's Founder Uber Incorporated. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. All right. So, what's out at the beach? That's actually a great question, Eric. I'm really happy you asked. Okay. I'm uh, going to a seminar. And you know what? Actually, I think this could be perfect for you. A seminar at the beach? Well, no, the seminar is not at the beach, but I have these pamphlets that I'm going to hand out. And if I can get 10 people to go with me, I get to go to the pre-seminar lounge. I get to meet the speaker face to face. So, so what's this guy speaking on? Get this. The golden streets of heaven can be yours. So it's all about how there's riches in heaven, and they can be yours if you just listen to God. So if you listen to God through this guy? Well, I'm not exactly sure about how that works, but I just know I'm an ordinary guy. I'm not doing anything important. I don't have any special skills well, besides bow staff, but oh. I'm, you know, I'm not doing anything important, but this, if I can get in on this, I think it can be my ticket. I think if I get in on this, I can retire in one, maybe two years tops. Do you mind if I swing into the fishing pier before we go to the beach? Sure. Okay, I got this guy, a friend of mine I want you to meet. He likes to go fishing once in a while. It reminds him of when he met Jesus. He met Jesus while he was fishing? Actually, he was a fisherman by trade. And um, yeah, hang on, he's right here. I see him. Hey, Peter, Pete. Oh, Eric. Come here, man. I want you to meet somebody. Hey, Eric, who's this? Hey, this is, uh, this is my buddy Lance. Actually, I was hoping you could talk with him. Yeah, I think he's got a couple of things that he needs some help with. Would you say that when Jesus called you into, into following him, that he called you into a life of prosperity and success on this earth? Oh, this has got to be a joke, right? Andrew, John, you guys back there? They had to put you up to this, right? This has to be a joke. It's not <laughs> no, a joke, right? It is not a joke. You're not getting punked, no. I swear. It. Seriously, I want you to talk with Lance because he's just got a few things that are mixed up. Yeah, can I hop in? Absolutely. You're going to love this guy. You guys catching anything today? Uh, they weren't quite biting. Yeah. A little too cold, I guess. Some guy wanted it a little colder. Nice. <laughs> I say you go off the other side of the pier.
Hey everybody, uh, we're going to start off today. You may see this bubble behind me and think, oh no, this is when we talk about retirement or my 401k. If you've been in the building at the founder, you may have seen this hovering at the top. Or if you haven't, you think, okay, what is what are we going to talk about with the 401k? Um, because when you bring up 401k, whether it be in church or outside of church, there's many different ideas and speculations when it comes to the 401k. Some people may see this and think fear, like, oh, maybe I'm not saving as much as I should, or I am definitely not ready to retire. And there's other people on the spectrum who are like, I, I'm feeling good about where my retirement's at. I feel good about what I've saved, but don't touch that money, right? Do, no one is allowed to do anything with that money. This question, how will this affect my 401k, um, is a big deal on some, some level to everybody. Um, and I think it stems back to comfort. We all want to be able to live a comfortable life in some way, regardless of what that may look like. Uh, we want to get to that point in life where we're able to relax and just maybe even th there's the stereotype of you want to get to the point where you're in the driveway waxing the hood of a Cadillac because you've got all the time in the world, you've got no more cares, and you're just able to live a comfortable life. See, regardless of where we're at in our lives now, s many of our goals are to reach something of that image, something of that picture where we're able to live a comfortable life. Uh, we do a lot of the things in our life to make it to that point. The decisions that we make, the extra hours we pick up, the things that we do, and the way that we live our lives are to reach something like that, to get a more comfortable life. And sometimes we even do things that we shouldn't do to get a comfortable life. We do things that we maybe regret or we take away time from our family. Um, there was a moment after me and Jalen got married that we were dirt poor. I'm talking super dirt poor. I was a part-time youth pastor and my wife was in her master's at Western Michigan. So we just had no money coming in whatsoever. And uh, I had a friend come up to me and say, I've got a friend who has a really good way to make a lot of money on the side and you don't need to do anything. And I'm like, isn't that always how it starts? Like, oh, yes, absolutely. Sign me up for free money and little work. Let's do some more of that. So I, I had a meeting with this guy, this friend of a friend, and I met with him, and he explained that what I do is I have you guys take out um, – some credit cards, and I have access to those numbers, and um, I buy things when they're on sale and get it shipped to you, and I need to use you guys to do this because the good deals, there's only, there's a limit on how many I can buy, so I need to get as many people doing this as possible, and I pay you to get things shipped to your house, and then I'll come pick it up, and I'm like, oh, this, uh, this sounds great. I not, don't need to do anything, and I get paid per package for him to buy things and just send it to our house and then he pays for it all sound it sounded great to me I thought this was fantastic so um, we sign up for this thing we send him all of our credit card information and then what started arriving at our house was vacuums here's a picture of the vacuums that started arriving at our house these huge boxes of vacuums and there would be times where we'd have family come over or friends and we'd like park our cars outside because we'd have 30 boxes of vacuums in our house or in our garage. And uh, they would ask, what is all this in here? What are you doing with this? And it was at that point that I started being like, I actually don't know how to explain what I'm doing. And morally, I started thinking, is this actually OK? And pretty quickly, I realized, no, it's not okay and some of it seems to be partially illegal but as me and my wife's thought about that it's like yeah we were willing to do that to live a more comfortable life we're we're willing to kind of dance the line of what was morally and legally allowed because we wanted to live a comfortable life and looking back now we were living a comfortable life before this i mean we didn't have much money coming in but we had a roof overhead we both had vehicles. Uh, my wife was enjoying being in school. We had food on the table. Um, by all worldly standards, we were living a comfortable life. And yet for us, it wasn't good enough. 
We wanted to take our already comfortable life and make it more comfortable so that we could go on vacations, so that we could do more house improvements. Um, We took what we had and we wanted to make it better and better and better. You see, I want to introduce you today to a character who wanted to live a comfortable life. Um, The man's name is Peter, um, and he was a disciple of Jesus. We've talked about Peter in the past. Um, Actually, in uh, I think it was two or three series ago, we were in a series on relationships to others. And we talked about the relationship between Peter and Jesus because it was an actually really interesting dynamic between the two because Peter followed Jesus and he and he knew that Jesus was the son of God and he knew the importance that Jesus held. And yet Peter, as a friend, um, failed miserably. Um, There was a moment when uh, Jesus was on trial where Jesus was getting beaten and mocked and Peter standing outside of the crowd kind of watching to see what's what is going on and uh, multiple people come up to him and say you're you're one of his disciples you you actually know this man and Peter denies Jesus three times that he he has never seen he doesn't know who this Jesus is talk talk about an awful friend Um, even to the point where Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's been deserted by many of his friends. Um, Peter is one of those who deserted him. Peter was not there for the last moments of Jesus's life here on earth. Um, This was a man who struggled to live. He wanted to live a comfortable life. He didn't want to create waves that were around him. You see, he denied Jesus. He left in those moments where Jesus probably needed him most because of what that could do to his life. Uh, If we look at the life surrounding Jesus, if he were to say, yes, I know who Jesus is, he may have found himself in the very spot that Jesus was. Um, And if you're striving to live a comfortable life, then you're not going to say things that are going to create waves. So a question I had is, okay, so what is the context around this? Why Why did Peter live in such a way? Because he knew who Jesus was. I believe strongly that he knew he was the son of God and all of the all of the things that Jesus had to offer this world. And yet Peter seemed to try and live this comfortable life. You see, Peter's life would have been living a life under Roman rule. Okay, so when Jesus was on earth, the Romans were in charge and they were actually a very brutal um a uh, brutal group of people who would just be awful towards the Jewish people and any any people they'd be ruling outside of the Romans. Um, taxation was a huge issue. Uh, the Jews would be taxed 30 to 40 percent is what many historians would believe. And they'd uh, the Romans would put people in charge of collecting those taxes. Matthew, one of the disciples, was a tax collector. And the way the tax collectors got paid is they were able to charge anything above and beyond that 30 to 40 percent in taxes um, they'd get to keep. So many tax collectors would just tax the Jewish people astronomically. It would be crazy to live under these times and be taxed by so much. Living a comfortable life for Peter would have been trying to make enough money to be able to pay taxes and then have enough to survive outside of that. He lived a life where um, starvation was a very real thing. Getting enough food was tricky. Fishing enough to provide enough fish for families around you. Um, uh, Executions were a very real thing. Rome was not afraid to make examples of people in that day. And they they showed the world that if you mess with Rome, the cross is where you'll be heading. See, if you made waves, if you spoke out against them, you would find yourself on a cross. See, even think of the way they had to live their everyday life outside of taxation and outside of providing food. Think about how they uh, had to warm up food, right? If they got a fish, how would they cook the fish, right? They would need they would need to get firewood to create enough heat to cook the fish. Well, if you're looking for firewood in a busy city, you'll have to go outside of the city limits to grab grab wood. 
And if you have got an entire city who's doing that, you're slowly getting farther and farther and farther out. And where Peter lives, I mean, this has been a well-established city. How far would they have needed to go to simply get firewood? Um, Everybody's doing these things. The idea of a comfortable life for Peter would have simply been trying to survive and staying underneath the radar. He doesn't want to create waves. He doesn't want the Roman guards looking at him. He doesn't want the tax collectors trying to get more money from him. He's just trying to live a simple life. See, I I don't want us to look at Peter's life of comfort and compare our lives of comfort because they're very different things. But at the end of the day, I do believe Peter was trying to stay below the radar a little bit. When we look at Peter's life, he was a disciple. Um, He knew who Jesus was, and he knew the benefits he offered. And yet, even knowing those things, he seemed to be pretty scared to live a life that was similar to Jesus. Right? When Jesus, we already talked about it, when Jesus needed him most, he was nowhere to be seen because I think Peter was worried about ending up right where Jesus was if he was in those moments. Let me paint a picture for you a minute, because the old Peter, the Peter one day before Jesus was crucified, was looking over Jesus as he was on trial, as he was being beaten, and a young girl, like a small girl, comes up to him and says, do you know this man? I feel like I've seen you with this man. And Peter, at his wit's end of not wanting to get out of his comfort zone, screams at the little girl, and he swears at her and says, I don't know the man. Shortly after that, Jesus is crucified. And 50 days after that, we see this moment of Pentecost where he is standing on the Temple Mount and the Antonian guard is um, right next to him. So picture this moment. Uh, Jesus has been crucified. Rome understands the power of what Jesus is saying and they are looking down on the Jewish people to make sure that they don't cause a revival, that they don't start a revolution against what they've done. So Rome, the guards, thousands of them potentially, are looking down on Peter and listening to the words he is saying to these thousands of Jewish people and Gentiles and all the people who have come to gather for this moment. Get this, 50 days Peter explains to them, Jesus, the one whom you crucified, right? It potentially wouldn't have been the people down that he's preaching to, but the Romans are all looking at them. Picture that moment. Picture the energy and the momentum that Peter would have needed to have to have that. That Peter is not a Peter who is looking for comfort. That's a Peter who is choosing the cross at that point. He realizes by saying those words, Jesus the one whom you crucified, by saying those things, he knows his fate. He knows that he is no longer choosing a life of comfort, that he is, he is choosing to make waves, but he does so because there is a good news about Jesus Christ that this world needs to hear, and he can no longer be contained by what Rome might do to him. Oh, I love that. Um, it continues um, in Acts 5. We see the le- he is a leader in the church of Jerusalem over the next few years. Peter rebukes some people when they lie about money that they re- they've received from selling some land. Um, it, it's another story where we see the confidence in Peter that he says, no, this is not an okay way to live. See, he's no longer this comfortable Peter that Jesus remembers as a disciple. He is a man on fire for the gospel, and he's on fire because the Holy Spirit is inside of his life. You see, this is such a drastic change in Peter. It is such a drastic change from this old, comfortable Peter to this Peter who is willing to stand on the Temple Mount and shout the good news about what Jesus Christ has to offer. See, I think um, in 1 Peter, there is there's some words that Peter writes to um, some Aryan churches in Asia Minor, I believe. And I think this paints the exact picture of who Peter has become. And it says this out of 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. So Peter understands this. 
right? He knows what Rome may be about to do to him. Don't be surprised at the fiery or ordeal. He is promising and trying to comfort the people that he's reaching out to, saying that this may happen. Don't be surprised if this, this is coming. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. See, he's saying rejoice if you're able to suffer for Jesus Christ. What a different, different tone of voice he has than the old Peter we knew. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of God, spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, he's preaching this to the new believers. If it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved. And I think he says this because he, he used to live in this way. Right, the righteous, he was trying to be righteous. He knew who Jesus was. He knew what he had to offer, and yet Peter wasn't willing to get outside of his comfort zone. It says this, if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, people who try to live the right things, they are not saved because of their own good works. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And catch this, verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to the faithful creator and continue to good, do good. So then, those who suffer according to God's will and will, should commit themselves to the faithful creator and continue to do good. Oh, what power in those words. What a drastic shift in the Peters that we read about. But the truth is, what, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us 2,000 years after these words were spoken to this group of people? What do we do with that in this context? Um, and I think I, our contexts are very different, right? We've explained that. We are not pushed to the point of death if we preach the good news about Jesus Christ. But there is a very similar comfort level that we try and live. See, the culture around us screams that we need to live a comfortable life that our life should be focused about making our already comfortable life even more comfortable and more comfortable. See, we want to get to that moment where we're waxing the hood of a Cadillac in the driveway. We want that kind of comfort. And our lives get so obsessed with trying to put in more hours and doing things to get us farther and farther ahead so that we live a more and more and more comfortable life. Think, think about how far vacuums have even come. Trust me, I know about vacuums now. Uh, I, I remember my mom, um, as she would clean the house, there'd be, there'd be the handle and then there'd be a long hose that would go to this other motor, the sucky part thing. Um, and you'd have to like be careful where you went around the house because you'd be dragging that and that would be dragging the cord and you're trying to go all, all over the house in that way to the point now where we live a comfortable life where we can turn on the Roomba and it can clean the house while we're gone. Right, think, guys, even with mowers, we've gotten to the point where there's little round mowers that'll mow our lawn while we sit in a lawn chair with a lemonade and an umbrella in our front lawn. See, we continue to try and make our already comfortable lives even more and more comfortable. But those are material items. Think about your own life. Think about the emotional and spiritual life in the way that you're living. Maybe you feel called to a job. You feel called that, that, that God is nudging you to do something different with your job. Maybe you feel like you shouldn't be in this job anymore, but you don't even know what's next. So you live in this world where, well, I can't leave my job because I've got insurance and I've got a good 401k package. Um, I've got a good salary and I don't, I don't want to give up my vacation. We, we live in this life of comfort and we don't want to give that up for even if we're being called. See, maybe you look at 
what your kids are involved in, whether it be sports or extracurricular or even think about the school. Um, and sometimes in those things, they are taught things that we don't believe in, that the gospel message doesn't say is okay. And we turn a blind eye and we look away because we don't want to cause any waves. We are not willing to reach out to any teachers because we don't want our kid to be ostracized because of that. Well, they should have friends, right? We don't want them to lose that if we don't speak up for what the teachers or what is happening in sports or what's happening in extracurricular activities. That is what comfort sometimes looks like in our life. Or maybe you're in a relationship um, and you've been dating this person for a while and comfort for you is just staying with that person because, well, by now you thought you'd be married and you really want to have kids soon and comfort for you is just staying with them even though maybe their values don't line up with you or maybe they don't believe what you believe and you don't want to give up the thought of having kids and just being married at this specific time in your life so you just allow yourself to continue to live that comfortable life with this person. See, the truth is, and the truth that Jesus told many of the disciples is that he did not call us to a life of comfort. Um, and if we continue to strive for this life of comfort, um, we're never going to be satisfied. We're never going to be satisfied with that life of comfort. Think back to Peter. Peter and the disciples were called to something very specific before Jesus left, left them there on earth. Um, Jesus, before he hung on the cross, gathered all of his disciples together and in Matthew 16 said this to them. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In that context, in that context, those words would be very real for those disciples. Some of which I think when Peter hold, heard those the first time, it's why he retreated so much. Because he fully understands what that life would look like. Um, what we know is that Jesus doesn't call us to a life of comfort. He calls us to the cross. So what does it cost us? What does it cost us at this day? Are we following at great cost? Are we following Jesus Christ at great cost? Or are we living a life of great convenience and just allowing our lives to be moved in whatever culture spins us in that way? See, the question may be, is it worth the cost? For Peter, I think he needed to ask that question. Is what I'm about to say, is it worth the cost? Um, there is uh, a man in the Old Testament so jump in, jump in thousands of years prior to this point. Uh, there's a man named Solomon. And if you don't know the character Solomon, he is a very wealthy man. Uh, he would have the world at his fingertips. We're talking property. We're talking great wealth. Um, he had any woman that he ever wanted, he could have. Um, and these are some words that he had to say. Talk about being able to possess all of the world at his fingertips. It says this. I observed everything going on under the sun. Really, he have, this is in uh, Ecclesiastes. I've observed everything going on in the sun. So he has the world at his fingertips. And really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. Solomon, the man who seemed to have everything, says these words, and it's meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. Have you ever chased after the wind? Right, you get that image of it's, it's meaningless. You can never get there. If you're trying to live a life of comfort and getting a more comfortable life, already more comfortable and more comfortable, you'll continue to chase it like chasing after the wind. Um, it's another man, um, thousands of years after this, uh, named St. Thomas of Becca. Um, and this man lived in uh, the day and age where I believe it was uh, King Henry II. Um, and there was some oppression 
towards the church and St. Thomas was sticking out sticking up for the gospel and who Jesus was and wasn't willing to stop preaching that good news and these are the words he says to um, to some of the King Henry's men that are coming down on him he says this if all the swords in England were pointed against my head your threats would not move me I am ready to die for my Lord that in my blood the church may obtain liberty and a peace. And it's, the, it's in that moment that he was killed. See, how different do those tones feel from St. Thomas to that of Solomon? Somebody who seemed to have everything at his fingertips and somebody who everything was taken from him. See, St. Thomas found the peace and hope in who Jesus Christ is was and what he had to offer this world and he was not willing to sacrifice or he was so willing to sacrifice us count the cost see i think we need to do that as a church count the cost are you willing to live this life if jesus calls us to a cross are you willing to go to the cross for the things that he has to say because i think we need to understand that if we're willing to live that life we need to be willing to be mocked we need to be willing to lose friendships. Um, you may be misunderstood by your family and the closest friends around you. But if you're acting in accordance with God's will and how the Holy Spirit is tugging into your life, then I promise you will be rewarded for it. It may not be rewarded here on earth like the comfort that our culture is screaming at us to try and attain, but we will be rewarded in eternal life with Jesus Christ. So church, Take that job. Go after that job that Jesus is calling you to. Maybe it's taking that leap of faith into the unknown that you don't know what the next step is. And it may be hard and it may take you out of your comfort zone. It may stop yourself from saving for that 401k so much. It may take insurance away because you step away from a job. But what does it look like in your lives to take a step of faith? See, in the end, we're told that it doesn't matter if our lives were pleasing to ourselves. If we look at the life of Solomon, I, I would argue he had everything. He, he pleased himself with all of the things around him, and yet he says it was meaningless. Are we going to try and attain those things, or are we going to live a life where we are called out of our comfort? I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm actually promising you with the words of Jesus that these things are going to be hard. We're called to a cross, not a Cadillac. And those words have always been true. Church, what does that look like in your life? To be honest, I'm looking at my life, and I've had a hard time developing this message because I've been convicted of some things in my life because I feel like I have a lot of comfort. I think many of us have a lot of comfort, but what does it look like to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and take, not be so rooted in trying to attain all the comfort, but being willing to do whatever it takes for the glory of Jesus Christ. And church, we live in a day and age where it's time that the people around us hear that good news. What do you do with it? Are you called to a cross or a Cadillac? The answer is, or the choice, really is yours. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the way you sent your Holy Spirit into Peter and the, the amount of transformation that happened in that moment. I ask that as we look at our lives, that you transform us, that we realize that it, it may not be easy, that we may not be able to live the comfortable life we want to live, but we are living a life that you're called us to. God, I ask that if, if we haven't even thought about what our lives look like as regards to comfort, that you open our eyes up to what you need us to do through those things. God, I thank you for your church, and I thank you for the ability to be able to gather. Um, but God, I ask that you send us out and, and say to the world what you need us to say to give that good news of your son and how he died on the cross for our sins. Um, give us the power that you gave Peter to do those things. In your name we pray. Amen.
So when we look at the life of Peter, we see somebody on the day of Pentecost who was transformed. We see somebody who is living maybe with just a little bit of fear of life, but then when the Holy Spirit comes and fills him, we see somebody who just transforms the image of God and takes steps of courageous obedience in furthering the gospel on earth. Um, he shared the word of God with 3,000 people on Pentecost. He stood up to the Pharisees and, and was persecuted time and time again for his faith. And this morning, I just want to encourage you that if there's something that's holding you back from being courageously obedient to Jesus Christ, that you would, you would surrender that to him and that you'd be faithful to God and you would follow him into whatever he's calling you into. You know, a lot of times that it's, it's hard um, to step into things that will mean we have to sacrifice comfort. My wife and I, we're currently in a spot in our life where we have a decision to make and we know that God is calling us to make this certain decision, but it's going to involve a sacrifice of comfort and it's hard. I think my wife's way better at it than I am and I'm just wrestling and struggling through it, but I know that when we're obedient to Jesus Christ, it's the best life that we can live. So I just want to encourage you this week, if there's something that you feel like God is calling you into and there's a comfort that's preventing you from stepping fully into that, I just want to encourage you, maybe today's the day that you step fully into what God is calling you to. Or maybe you're living in a spot where everything is comfortable. Ask God to give you um, just the ears to hear him and what he might be calling you into. We know that it can be difficult, it can be challenging, but we know a life after the Lord Jesus Christ is the best life to live. So I just encourage you in that this morning. And as you go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you have a prayer request this morning or you would like to pray with somebody, you can text the keyword um, Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number three key. Otherwise, we are in the month of August. I would guess I would consider this the last third of summer. So enjoy it. Get outside. Enjoy the beautiful weather we have. And um, we look forward to worshiping with you again next week.